For hundreds of years, small fishing boats have set sail to bring home the riches of our coastal waters. He's got one! He's got a lungfish! Yes! But fishing is changing. In recent years, many of our inshore skippers have gone out of business. Can they survive the threats to their future? It's a tricky time, and it's going to be for another few more years yet. Marine biologist Monty Halls is going to explore the challenges facing our fishing industry, but from the inside. Monty's seen the problems fishermen face. Now he wants to look for solutions. He learns how trawlermen are minimizing their impact on the environment. Although when the bag comes aboard it doesn't look like much, but because there's literally nothing to go back over the side, it's better than what you think generally. Yeah. Monty sees how fishermen can turn waste into profit. That will be at a Japanese restaurant tomorrow morning in uh, thin slices. And he heads overseas, where he discovers a revolutionary way of supporting our traditional fishermen. I take pride in the fish I land. This fish will be right to the consumer by this afternoon. Right. In and out, no messing about, fresh yeah. fish. The fishermen of Cadgewith Cove try to be out at sea before 7.30 in the morning. It's October, so they're loading up and launching in the dark. For the past six months, Monty Halls has been experiencing life as a small boat fisherman. His mentor, Nigel Legg, has fished here for more than four decades, and he knows there are tough times ahead. Okay, the weather is different now than it was in the summer. Um, if it's like this, it's sort of okay, but, you know, any time now, there's nothing to have a month or six weeks off solid. What, where you can't fish? You, you can, well, even the bigger ones can't go. Right. So, if you go to London yeah. and say to somebody who's got a full-time permanent job and say, I'm taking six weeks of your wages, and that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, it is there's no magic about it, that is what it is. The lobsters that Nigel targets in summer months also sense bad weather is on the horizon, and they're beginning to move offshore. So Nigel's changing tactics. He set nets for bass, hoping they are now moving into shallow waters. Well, there we are, there's one. We caught her bass. Gonna need more than one. Well, we've got dinner. We have. <laughs> Don't pay the bills, but we got dinner. Well, I got dinner. Yeah. Good grief, what a beast. Though he's targeted bass, Nigel's also catching wrasse, mackerel, and the odd shark. A mature taupe like this could be more than 40 years old. Look at that, that's fantastic. Beautiful, you know, that's a proper shark, that. It's a female, full of eggs. And Nigel's going to give it a second chance. Sharks are kind of in trouble. At the moment, 100 million a year taken out of the sea, and Nigel, being the magnanimous fella he is, has said we can put this fella back, which is great. I don't like killing them, I really don't. It's not worth much per kilogram, but such a large taupe is by far the most valuable thing Nigel's caught today. I mean, you've just stuck that shark back. You have, in essence, chucked 40 quid overboard. People think fishermen just catch and kill everything, but that isn't the case. They, it isn't like that at all. Apart from two bass and some mackerel, few of the other fish are worth selling. We've actually got a fair few fish here. You know, it's interesting that of those fish, there's probably only three or four in here that have commercial value, isn't it? Obviously, you've got the bass. We've also got a lot of wrasse, and this, I think, is one of the snags we have in terms of the way we consume fish in this country, is that 
that really doesn't have any commercial value. You'll use these as bait, we, won't you? We do use them as bait. You can eat them. There's nothing wrong with them whatsoever. Um, it's just that we've never been brought up to eat them. If Nigel could sell abundant fish like wrasse, his income would improve significantly. Instead of selling four fish for, say, 15 or 20 quid today, which I know is nonsense really, you know, that box of fish possibly could be 50 quid. Yeah. Well, that's slight, slightly different. Yeah. Cornish fishermen catch more than 100 different fish species. But in the current market, only a few are sold in any significant quantity. The rest, known as bycatch, are thrown back into the sea. That is a beautiful, firm-bodied fish. Fish, full of meat, there. Look, look. Full of meat, yeah. That's, 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 that's no different than that, different colour. Yeah. And that's, you know, if Nigel wasn't using it for, for bait, it'd go, just go straight back over the side. It's a tragedy, that's protein. There's a massive protein shortage in the world and we're chucking things like that away just because we're not used to eating it. And maybe a lot of the fault with bycatch lies very much with us and not with the fishermen I. If we want to support our fishermen and protect the marine environment, we need to start eating more of the fish that are caught off our coast. The nets that Nigel and the other Cadgeworth skippers use are called static gear. They do not move in the water. But most of the fish landed in the UK are caught using mobile gear, such as the nets towed behind trawlers. A few weeks ago, Monty worked on a beam trawler and caught lots of unwanted species. Now he wants to find out if anything can be done to reduce bycatch. He's come to Mevagissi, a large fishing village 30 miles up the coast. Tomorrow he's going out on the Valhalla, one of a new breed of environment-friendly trawlers. It's 4 a.m. The nets are lowered into the water under the watchful eye of skipper Dave Warwick. I noticed that we headed out heinously early, you know, whatever it was, 3.30 in the morning. Why is that? I mean, that's our general time to come to sea, but haddock fishing can be better in the dark. So we like to come out and get this first haul where you start in the dark and you tow through what we call the dim sea, where it's coming in daylight. That's generally the best time. I've learned two things about fishing during my embryonic fishing career. Number one is everything is very heavy, and number two is everything is very early. Yeah. Those are the two things I've learned. Yeah. So, um, That's not a bad estimation of it, really. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, trawling. Two otter boards, metal plates that are attached to either side of the net, are lowered into the water. The otter boards have gone into the water. They've gone in about four meters apart. When they get into the water, they'll open out. As we move through, they'll just go like this, and they'll open out the mouth of the net until the mouth of the net is about 30 meters apart. So they'll go sort of six, seven times the distance they are now. They'll just move out, open the net up like this, and that'll sink to the bottom, and then we'll start fishing. Unlike beam trawling and scallop dredging, where heavy metal chains are dragged over the ocean floor, most otter trawls have lighter rubber wheels on their bottom rope. These roll and bounce over the seabed, causing less disturbance. After three hours in the water, the nets are hauled up. This may look like any other trawl net, but it has been specially designed to minimize bycatch. Sections of the net have larger holes, allowing more escape opportunities for small, unwanted fish.
in essence, Dave, that, that size mesh, you're fishing a slightly larger mesh, and that means the juveniles are getting through, the next generation of fish are getting through. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're looking after our own interests by letting the smaller fish go, and, you know, next year or the year after, when they've grown, we'll, we'll hopefully catch them again, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, we have bad press, people think we're out here to catch the last fish in the sea, we're not. We're out here to, to make a living, and for generations after us to make a living behind us. Now the fish are on board, it's time to sort the valuable species from the unwanted catch. What you're doing here, uh, Dave, by adopting this system of, of the slightly larger nets, uh, net size, is you're bringing your discard right down. Yeah. So it's mainly haddock we've got here, yeah. isn't it? Although when the bag comes aboard it doesn't look like much, we found this since we've been working this net, you'd look at it and think, isn't a very good all, but because there's literally nothing to go back over the side, it's, yeah. it's better than what you think generally. Yeah. As well as reducing bycatch, large mesh means less drag, so less fuel is burnt, increasing profits. And fewer starfish, urchins and rocks end up in the net, so the fish are less damaged. For, for us, the cleaner we can get it and the less sort of rubbish that's left in the net, in with the fish, the better it is. Yeah. Better for the fish, better for us. The quality of the fish goes a long way on the market. The better the quality, yeah. the, the, the keener the, the buyers are to buy it. And you get a reputation. I was going to say a lot of it is a name. If you get yeah. if you get a good name for landing good quality fish, the buyers will buy it repeatedly, time after time. Yeah. They'll look for your name on the fish yeah. boxes, won't they? Yeah. In recent years, Fishermen and fish scientists have been at loggerheads, unable to find common ground. But on board the Valhalla is government scientist Tom Catchpole from CFAS, the marine science organization. Two years ago, Tom and his team set out to try and reduce discards on otter trawls. Dave and 18 other skippers from the southwest designed and tested specially made nets. Discards were reduced by as much as 55%. Since then, most of the skippers who took part have decided to carry on using larger mesh nets. This is the basket of uh, fish which will be discarded. So right. this will be thrown over the side. Right. What we've got here is half a basket, or third of a this basket, a, yeah. compared to the sixth basket that we've kept, and nothing yeah. else has been destroyed or killed for that no, catch. That's it, yeah. That's so that, exactly. this is a very sort of a sustainable this, and an environmentally friendly way of fishing. This could really. be considered a very clean catch. Yeah. 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 Do you find your reception on the boats is a uh, you're well received generally on the boats? Yes, I mean the the program is on a purely voluntary basis. So we are we are reliant on the goodwill of the industry to allow us to come on board and measure the fish. So they're now under no obligation to have us on board. It's, it's undeniable that the fish stocks are under stress. There's no doubt about that, particularly certain target species. And to feed the markets, the insatiable desire of the, of the fish markets, and our demand for fish, there's always going to be bycatch. But what I've seen today is half a basket of fish as bycatch and six baskets of target species being caught. The environmental impact of what we've done today has been really, really minimal. And that does give me real hope that there is a way of doing this in the future that's sustainable. And the truly great thing is that it's an initiative that's been led by the fishermen. And that, that really gives me a lot of hope. It's been a great day, I've enjoyed it. Similar net trials have been carried out on beam trawlers, halving discards. The success of such schemes show how fishermen and scientists can work together and how being more sustainable can be good for business too. Netting from small boats is one of the most targeted forms of fishing. The mesh size of the gill nets they use is specific to the head of the fish you want to catch. Small juvenile fish swim right through Mature fish poke their head into the mesh and are caught by their gills. People will have different size nets for different size fish. The scales start small for a red mullet net, 
and it ends up really big for like a monk net. You know, there's all sorts of different things in between which people use, so you can target your species more, you know? Born and bred in Catchwith, Luke Stevens has fished all his life. But the job took its toll on his body. Physically unable to work at sea, he now makes some of the finest nets in the area. Do you miss fishing? Yeah, I do miss it a bit, but don't miss the uh, early mornings. No, no, I sympathise entirely. It's quite nice entirely. to sort of be in bed, you know? Yeah. <laughs> But I'm still sort of fishing in a way because I, I can make nets now and, you know, they'll, they'll do the fishing for me, you know, and I get a great satisfaction of, of making something and producing something which somebody can use. The only bit that's missing is I'm not at sea. Luke is using extra fine filament for this gill net. It's very hard to see when it's in the water, so this net should catch more fish in less time. The net is secured to the rope every seven holes along. Monty's going to lend a hand. Now the key is, remember seven? Yeah. If you can offer it up to yourself like that. Yeah. And you can just weave it in and out. Five, six. You want it to be about two fingers. Yeah. Do a bit there. So you lined it up yeah. with the black bit. Through that way. Yeah. Pull it sort of slightly tight, put your thumb on it. Cast your string over there through this way and one back that way. It's casting the string over, that's what I haven't been so doing. So then you pull that tight that way and yeah. that won't be there until the cows come home. Totally confident now. For every fisherman, it's estimated that there are at least four other jobs on shore. Even though it has declined in recent years, the fishing industry is a key employer in many of our coastal communities. After an hour or so, Monty finally gets to his end of the net. But something is wrong. Being brutally honest, somehow you've got all this many right. left on your last staple. Ah. So it seems to suggest to me that you sort of <laughs> haven't Mastable. picked up the right amount somewhere along the line. Ah. <laughs> Look at that. Yes, all. that's really quite a lot, isn't it's it? It's like one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ah, oh, let's try this one. One, two, three, four, five, six. He can't count. <laughs> he can't. He's done all that. <laughs> oh, dear. Shall I do it again? Well, we'll be here another week if you do that. Most of the nets that Luke makes are used on one small boat. It usually fishes east of the Falmouth Bay area, 15 miles or so up along the coast from Cadgewith. It's just coming up to dawn, and I'm on a boat called the Lady Hamilton, which I've heard a great deal about because of the way the boat fishes and also the quality of the fish that this boat produces. It's almost legendary around here. At the helm is Chris Bean. He's one of the highest grossing small boat skippers in Cornwall. Monty wants to see how he operates, to uncover the secret of his success. It's 5 a.m. The extra fine nets made by Luke Stevens are set before dawn on the best fishing grounds. Chris will be back to check these nets in a few hours. In the meantime, he hauls some tangle and sole nets he shot a day or so ago, targeting bottom-dwelling fish and crustaceans. Whoa That's the biggest lobster I've seen since I've been in Cornwall. Second in command, Chino from Ecuador and deckhand Andreas from Lithuania process the catch. Chris might be a successful skipper, but he still struggles to find locals willing to do the job. The lack of young British men working in fishing is one of the major threats to the future of the industry. Every single fish that comes up is carefully sorted. Nothing is thrown back. Did you keep the dogfish? 
Chris? Yeah, yeah. We sell them. Yeah. You sell them? Yeah. That'll be in a Japanese restaurant tomorrow morning in uh, thin slices. We, we have been selling them for bait to the crabbers, but now we're, there's so much added value by processing them that the, the amount that we're able to release yeah. for bait is getting less and less. Chris has worked hard on shore to find markets for everything he catches. Species that other fishermen would consider valueless, like wrasse, are now earning him decent money. We have blind tests with uh, Japanese chefs with many different species, and they all come out and say the wrasse is the best. Really? He even sells monkfish livers to sushi restaurants. My mother would never leave us, uh, let us uh, leave anything on the side of the plate. You, if it was on your plate, you ate it. Waste not, want not. And that's the, uh, the motive I've been brought up with. And uh, with, to me, to go to sea and catch fish, that was, uh, it was ridiculous to be throwing fish away that were going to be wasted. After six hours at sea, it's time to check the extra fine nets they set before dawn. This is a, a, a bit of a kind of specialty of Chris, really. These very fine nets that are in the water just for a few hours. They catch pristine fish, which go to the very best markets. We can't market fish that is overnight in a net because it's, uh, the gills have gone pink, they're not gleaming red, the eyes have lost their luster and so on. And they, that, those sort of fish can only be filleted. And most of our fish that we send away is whole fish in pristine condition. And the only way to guarantee that is to have very short soak times with the nets. Chris has been fishing these grounds for more than 40 years. But a good haul still gets him excited. Good, jumbo mackerel. Proper job. Wow. And they're all big ones. Look at that. Wow. Beautiful wow. fish Fantastic. as well. Fantastic. Well, that was a nice little break, wasn't it? They're all right, yeah. Yeah, lovely. Like firm bodied. Three quid a fish. Fresh. These nets are specifically made to target haddock, but it's impossible not to catch other species, especially cod. The cod have got a design fault in that these little notches here get caught in the nets. See? They get caught no matter what size of mesh, yeah. they get caught. Concerned that it was being overfished, the government has imposed strict catch limits on cod. At the moment, no small Cornish boats have been allocated any cod quota. So Chris has to throw back every fish that comes up in his nets. That's a cod which is indicative of the size of the cod that are out here at the moment. And that, according to the Majesty's government, has to go back over the side. The EU estimates that its fishing fleet catches two to three times more fish than is sustainable and that 75% of species in European waters are currently being overfished. Some controls on fishing are essential for the future of fish and fishermen. Perception is, Chris, and uh, you know, I have this perception as well, that cod stocks are very low and that's the reason they shouldn't be caught. But it's not the case here. The cod stocks have been absolutely fantastic here for the last year or two years. We've never seen anything like it. Last winter, they were in right inside in 10, 15 meters, and there were no other fish. All we caught was cod, cod, cod. Government scientists have confirmed that the cod population is healthy in these waters. Chris and other Cornish fishermen are expecting a corresponding increase in the monthly quota, but it is yet to materialize. Yeah, hello, Michelle. Uh, can I speak to Dylan, please, about the cod, see if there's any, any uplift here? Chris calls his son on shore to see if there's any word from the authorities. Oh, no. Oh. Okay, yeah. Next week or the week after, 
they're going to make a decision and it could be that they're not going to release any more quota. It's very galling if you're at the sharp end, you know, you're catching fish and you've got no quota and you have to throw it back. And, and the only reason you haven't got any quota is they haven't sorted it out, you know? And why haven't they sorted it out? Because they're, they're, they're inept, you know? And, and this is, you know, I, for that reason, the anger comes out. And I, you know, I would like to see heads roll. I would, honestly, I would like to see some people held to account for this. The job description and the job title, isn't it? We're fishermen, you know? We go and catch fish. No, nobody wants to dump fish. Nobody. Nobody. It's heartbreaking, to be honest. We've got such a small cod quota, and there's more cod here than I have ever seen. They've been in the crab pots, they're in the nets, they're in the tangle nets, and you don't catch more than a kilogram over and land it, because you, you know, three goes at that, you go a kilogram over, you're threatened with prosecution. So you always got to be watching your weights all the time. I mean, just madness. It is madness, the whole thing. Billions of cod have been discarded in European waters over the last 50 years. The European Union is reviewing the quota system and has said it will put an end to discarding. But until something is done, Chris, who makes the most of every other fish he catches, will be forced to keep throwing cod over the side. You can understand the basic concept behind quotas, but it heavily impacts boats like this. Chris hasn't set out to catch these fish, they're just bycatch. It's just an inevitable part of the massive number of cod that are around here at the moment. And yet, when these fish come up, they're dead. And yet, here it is, this beautiful prime white fish, and uh, it's just wasted, it's just thrown away. It's carrying, it's going back to the gulls. And surely on every level, that's nonsense, surely. All the nets are hauled. It's time to head back to the Lady Hamilton's moorings just off Helford. Most fishermen's work is almost done when they get ashore. Yeah. But Chris's is just beginning. One kilo of size two gurnet. 5.4 jumbo. 10.2 size three pollock. And do you have pre-existing orders for this? So your no. phone, the orders no. are phoning in? No pre-existing orders. The, um, the, the buyers have to wait until we tell them what we've got. Oh, I see, so it's the other way around. Yeah, it's yeah. the other way around. Yeah, that's the ethos of the operation, really. Yeah. So the buyers adapt their habits to whatever you've caught that's, on that day? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Only if they're very good quality and if they're big ones. Chris's son Dylan gets busy letting his customers know what's been caught. 76 four boxes. Thank you. Dylan's wife, Mutsuko, boxes the orders in ice. She's Japanese and has helped to develop relationships with sushi restaurants in London, where much of the fish will end up tomorrow morning. The Beans also have a small shop supplying local trade, and they run stalls at farmers markets. Working in this way, they get at least 30% more for their catch than if they sold it on the open market. Monty can see how, by making a direct connection with consumers, and by trading on the freshness and quality of their catch, Small boats can prosper. If you want to do the job, you've got to do it properly. I mean, you've got to see the thing all the way through, yeah. from the boat to the consumer, and putting it on that lorry, on that truck to go to London for delivery at 9 o'clock is almost as good as serving the consumer, isn't it? You're getting fish, yeah. you know, it's 24 hours old or less. Yeah. You know? that, and that, that's the satisfying part about the job, really. Right, see you, folks. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rob. One of Chris's oldest and most loyal customers is a sushi restaurant in London's financial district. Every morning, fish from yesterday's catch is delivered so the chefs can prepare it for the lunchtime shift. 
Owner Caroline Bennett explains how she has adapted her menu to fit with the way small boat fishermen work. We try and classify things as loosely as we can. So, for example, we've got dishes here that just say daily catch from Cornwall. Daily catch from Cornwall could be anything from a pollock to a wrasse to a megrim to a dogfish. This is quite key because you're altering your consumption to what the boats are catching and not the other way around. That's absolutely it. So rather than saying, as we used to, we want 10 kilos of red snapper and 5 kilos of mackerel, now we say to Chris, we'll have 10 kilos of any flat fish and 5 kilos of a blue fish. So if you can imagine lots more restaurants doing the same thing, the discards and the wastage would be instantly reduced. Caroline's motivation is not just getting the best quality fish for her customers. She believes anyone who eats fish has a pivotal role to play in making the fishing industry more sustainable. The burden and the onus is on the consumer. If they're going to go to a restaurant and they expect to eat bass, then they're already telling the signals to the marketplace, you've got to catch me bass. And the fish will say, well, I caught you with your bass, but I also caught this and this and this and that. What am I going to do with those? Um, and that's the consumer that's wasting it. The chefs have prepared a plate of fish that were all caught on the Lady Hamilton. You can really see there, can't you, that, you know, yeah. this sheen on it, yeah. that that was swimming around yeah. off the mouth of the Helford yeah. <laughs> 12 hours ago, it's you know, brilliant, 14 hours ago. It's yeah. And if it's not fresh, it really doesn't leave that, that great aftertaste in your mouth. And Chris's fish is just, as you know, exceptional, and it just feels like you're eating a hit of the ocean. I've been chucking that dogfish over the side of my boat with a little part of my heart breaking every time I do it. Yeah. Uh, ever since I started fishing, and every small boat pretty much does the same unless they're keeping it for bait. Um, the liver there, the monkfish liver, exactly the same. Yeah. You know, that just goes to the gulls. Discards. Basically. Yeah. Basically. So what you're doing here is essentially using just about all the catch. You're trying to use as much as of the much catch of it as it possible. As you can. Absolutely. Yeah. And that obviously benefits the environment because less is taken out of the sea and it clearly benefits Chris because he can make a living out of it. Yeah. Chris Bean and his family have worked hard to build relationships with specific customers. But most of the Cadgeworth skippers are more concerned with what happens at sea rather than on shore. And for men like Nigel Legg, fishing is not so much a business as a way of life. Well, the funny thing is when I go out in the mornings now, I probably enjoy it more because I actually take notice of the sun rising and the clouds and the wind and the colours in the sky. That's your world then, for six or eight hours, that is where you are, and you are on your own. I suppose being a fisherman, you always got this dream of big catch around the corner, but even if you've got a poor catch, I'm not despondent and mad or anything else. I always remember once, there was something telling me I should put my nets there. I don't really know what it was. The gulls were sitting on the water, I had the nets in the boat, the weather wasn't particularly good, but something was telling me, you know, stick the nets out. The next day, I had over 50 stone of bass, which, and I remember saying to myself, don't haul this lot in too quickly, enjoy it, because this ain't gonna happen very often. One of my biggest fears is, the day is gonna come when I've gotta sort of leave that boat to somebody else. I've been with the damn thing now for 30 years, it is a big, big thing to sort of leave and um, yeah, she is part of me really. The word finally comes through that the government has released COD quota. Small boats are now allowed to catch 250 kilograms of cod each before the end of the month. But bad weather is on the horizon, so the race is on. There's a sudden surge of activity in the cove in response to this news, in response to the quota being released. Suddenly they can go after this fish that's been here for ages. Everyone's kitting up, getting their nets in the water and trying to make the most of this little bonanza that'll last for at least a couple of weeks.
every day I've been fishing in Cadworth, I've learned a little lesson about fishing. And the lesson today is always tuck your gloves inside your sleeve. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my lesson ah, today. <laughs> Monty is out on the Victoria Ann. Skipper Lewis Mitchell is a lobsterman in the summer, but in the autumn and winter months, he teams up with part-time fisherman Dominic Goldsack and goes for whatever fish swims into the bay. And what do you think of all this netting business? Well, it's just what we've got to do, I suppose, to make a living. In the winter here, it's quite exciting, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I you can know, imagine. Conditions, trying to get off the beach, just everything's rigged against you. And do you kind of look forward to this time of year? Oh, you know, like... with relish. <laughs> Whoa, it's a beast! It's not long before they haul up the first cod of the day. I never doubted, even for a moment. COD, COD. Government scientists confirmed that the cod population was healthy in Cornish waters back in the summer. But it has taken four months for the extra quota to be released. If I'd been holding this fish on this boat two days ago, I'd be chucking it over the side for the crabs. And now, because of some distant bit of legislation and bureaucracy, the guys can now sell it. It's a legal fish. They may be catching lots of cod, but Lewis sells into the same market as the big boats, and the price can fluctuate dramatically. And what do you get per kilo for cod? Well, it has been known to be like 50p, like, in January, you know? Right. Cod should sell for between two and three pounds a kilogram, but if a lot is landed by bigger vessels, the price plummets. I suppose we are competing in the whole marketplace, you know, big boats as well as small boats, so they operate on bigger quantities. They're also trying to make their living that way, but you are competing in that market as well. After hauling all of their nets, they have a bin of cod and other saleable species. Instead of going to market, these prime fresh fish could be on a consumer's plate within 24 hours, just like Chris Bean's catch. Monty is starting to think that there must be another way for the thousands of small boat skippers in the UK to sell their fish. And I wonder if there's a, a system or a way that it can be sold direct, direct to the consumer. So you're cutting out the middleman and retaining the value of what's freshly caught produce from a small community like Cadwin. The twin pressures of falling financial returns and increasingly stringent government regulations are making it very hard to turn a profit as an inshore skipper. But these aren't just problems for UK fishermen. On America's east coast, small boats are having an even harder time. But Monty's heard that the fishermen here are starting to turn their industry around. He wants to find out if any lessons can be learned abroad that could help our fleet at home. He's traveled to New England on America's east coast to the fishing port of Gloucester, 25 miles northeast of Boston. Monty's come here to see how the US fleet is coping with change. And to get a British fisherman's perspective, he's brought Nigel with him. Best time of the year to be here as well, isn't it? Look at the colours, I think. Just amazing. It's important to take Nigel along on the America trip. One fisherman can spot another fisherman across the width of the Atlantic, no problem at all. And Nigel obviously can really speak the language and he can understand the issues facing them. Gloucester is one of the most iconic fishing ports in the world. For hundreds of years its boats fished rich offshore grounds like the Grand Banks. Fortunes were made. But overexploitation resulted in fish stocks crashing. 
Since the mid-1990s, the government has come down hard on the fleet. Many skippers are being forced out of business. Jack Flaherty has been a tuna and swordfish fisherman for more than four decades. He's seen a once vibrant industry brought to its knees. It's just a shadow of what it was 25, 30 years ago. We lost 21 small fishing vessels in Gloucester last year alone. For every man on deck of a boat, there were five shoreside jobs. Welders, boat rights, boat caulkers, fish packers, fish cutters, truck drivers, ice house workers. It's, it's all gone. It's, it's somewhat sad to see Gloucester transform from a bustling fishing port to a, basically a yacht basin surrounded by a ghetto. That's what's happening here. And not only is an industry being destroyed, but a, a, a very unique lifestyle. It's sad. It's sad. I, I'm, I'm at the end of my rope and my fishing career. And uh, I tell young folks that they come around and, oh, we want to go fishing. <laughs> no, you don't. It's a stacked deck and it's not in your favor. This is a very strange thing, Mark, because we've, we've come 3,000 miles to almost come home, really. It, yeah. it, it's all the same. It's no, it's no different, is it? Yeah, yeah, it's just, very true. Very true. The dramatic decline of America's East Coast fleet has prompted a fight back. Fishermen have developed an innovative way of maximizing the return they get for their catch. Monty and Nigel are heading out on a trawler that sells fish into the new scheme. Just like back home, trawlermen get up early. They're at sea before dawn. Skipper Joe Rizzo is hoping to catch flounders and other flatfish five miles or so offshore from Gloucester. This spot here in particular, we're just trying it out, you know, for the for, uh, future, you know, so if there's no gear here, so say tomorrow if there's fish here, tomorrow I'll come right back over here. That's part of the kind of joy of fishing, I suppose, isn't it? You're yes. trying out new areas all the time. Oh, you yeah. never, you never really know, do you? You just you don't know. know. Yeah, that's fishing. That's why they call it fishing. Yeah, and, that's uh... true. Joe's boat, the Razo, is a small otter trawler, like the Valhalla Monty worked on a few weeks ago. Out on deck are Joe's brother Rob and Al Catone. Al has his own small trawler, but often crews for his friend. Well, three o'clock this morning is pretty cold, but. Uh... And the bed was warm. Do you still enjoy getting up every morning? Uh, I, I, I love it. It's, it's, it's the only job in the world, believe me. The freedom, you know, one with nature and all, all the cliches you can come up with, they're all, they're all true. It's uh, no place I'd rather be. Al has been working these grounds for more than 20 years. He witnessed the dramatic decline of stocks as a result of overfishing. In the mid-90s, there was, there was a serious problem stocks wise with codfish and a few flounder species and I, I was actually the ones who welcomed the hard regulations because I knew something had to be done and a lot of the old timers who were a lot wiser than me said if the government steps in they will never take their foot off your throat and essentially that's what's happened the more the stocks got better the more regulations they put on us Small boat fishermen like Al believe the stringent regulations favor the biggest boats in the fleet and are only succeeding in driving smaller vessels like the Razo out of business. It would be like a domino effect to get rid of the smaller boats. Basically in, in every business it would be the same thing. Once you start eliminating from the bottom up, eventually there's going to be four people left in the business. Yeah. And in order to prevent it, we have to keep every single fisherman going now, going. We've already lost a few of the smaller guys. The more we lose, the more we're going to lose. But we're trying to stop that domino effect now. The trouble is, uh, once you've lost it, uh, nobody will ever come back to it exactly. again. Once the boats are gone, they're gone. Exactly. You've lost the expertise and the, uh, you know, yeah. all, the, all your comrades are gone then. And yeah. it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's sad to see, but, I mean, we're, we're, we're trying to keep everybody going. That's my philosophy going into this. I want to see everyone fishing now to keep fishing. 
man. I'm not. I'm not going anywhere. I'm. I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. After a few hours trawling, the nets are hauled onto the deck. That's good. Due to the concerns about overfishing, the government increased the size of the net holes. The Razo is now using one of the largest mesh sizes in the world. It's great to hear you say, Al, that you're endorsing the big mesh size. Oh, I am. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Because that's key, isn't it, as well, that the fishing community adopts that and says, yeah. I, I truly believe, and I'm not the only one, that the mesh size yeah. rebuilt the fishery. That's right. because in the early 90s, the cod stock was in, was in tough shape. Yeah. And we went to bigger mass, bigger mass, and we went to the square, the square bag. Yeah. The escapability of the round fish made all the difference in the world. Right. That's great to hear. Live and learn. Yeah. Cool. It's a good haul. Lots of flatfish and lots of cod. The best of these fish will not be sold on the market. They are going directly to local consumers as part of a community-supported fishery scheme known as a CSF. There's no messing about here, is there? This is going to be gutted, landed within the hour, and uh, then it will go straight... Straight to, well, straight to market. Straight to or, market, exactly. Yeah, which in this case is the community-supported fishery. Yes. Yeah. This fish will be right to the consumer by either this afternoon or tomorrow. If we get in early enough, it'll be this afternoon. Right. And that's really one of the beauties, isn't it? Yep. Of the small boat, the way you operate. Absolutely. In and out, no messing about, fresh yep. fish. Al and Joe are part of the Gloucester CSF, which was set up two years ago. The portion of their catch that they sell into the scheme fetches a slightly higher guaranteed price. As a result, their income has increased by as much as 30% just enough to see them through hard economic times. Yeah, you kind of want someone who has one of these fish to say, that didn't taste like a fish that I'm used to eating, right. and I want another one. Yeah. yeah. If you're, if you're going to get a CF, CSF fish, or fish from market, you're going to notice a difference. Yeah. The Razo arrives back in Gloucester and lands the catch. There are now three dozen other boats supplying the community-supported fishery with a ton and a half of fish every week. Rather than putting the middlemen out of business, local fish merchants like Ocean Crest are part of the scheme and have adapted the way they buy fish for the CSF. Manager Lenny Parco explains how it works. When the otters come in, I get them on a daily basis, and then I choose which fish we're going to use for that particular day based on what the boats are catching and what's the best quality. You know, one week it may be haddock, which tend to be a high-priced fish. Another week it could be pollock, which is a lesser-priced fish. And on average, you know, it all works out. Customers get whatever has come up in the nets, encouraging people to eat different species and minimizing bycatch. More than a thousand local people now buy fish this way, and more are joining every day. It's good for us because it gives us a whole new customer base. Uh, it's good for the boats because it allows me to give them a little bit more money for their fish. Uh, and it's good for the uh, consumer because they're getting the best quality fish possible, stuff that they just wouldn't have access to otherwise and they get it for a good price. It's a win-win for, for everyone as far as I can see. It certainly hasn't hurt my business at, at, at all. It's been, a, it's been a benefit, if anything. The fish are driven to Needham, a middle-class suburb on the outskirts of Boston. Five days a week, there are drop-offs like these in the 20 communities around Gloucester that are part of the scheme. Steve Toussignon is employed to coordinate deliveries. We've done a survey asking, you know, what was the motivation behind joining the program. Uh, primarily, the freshness and quality of the fish seem to be, you know, basically foodies, you know, people who really enjoy cooking and eating. Uh, and then there's folks that are inclined for the environmental and sustainable aspects of the program, you know, to ensure that the fishermen get paid a higher price for their catch, they're keeping all their monies in the local economy, 
and then also reducing the carbon footprint of bringing dinner to your table. It's a real kind of premium product oh, yeah. in a way. It's oh, yeah. straight, fresh from the sea. Yeah. And, and it's less expensive. Yeah. That's not to like. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> good for you. Enjoy. All right, there you are. Thank you. Thank you. No money changes hands. Just like with a vegetable box scheme in the UK, people pay in advance, so they are actively investing in their local fishing fleet. I love that I can actually support the community and, and the fishermen. I, everything about it is absolutely fabulous. You know, we know that, that the fishing industry generally has, has taken a beating here in the Northeast, and you know, it's, it's one of those things, you don't want to lose it. Uh, so, for me, you know, the number one motivation is to support you know, the local fisher people uh, so that they can continue doing what they're doing and bringing us the best that there is to, to be brought to us. That's the lovely thing, isn't it? Because you're supporting your local fishing community, but the way you're doing it is by eating the best fish in America. The idea of small boats selling direct to local consumers is spreading like wildfire. In only a few years, 26 similar schemes have been set up in the USA and Canada, and 12 more are in the pipeline. But could it work somewhere like Cajwith, which only has a small fishing fleet? Further up the coast is Port Clyde. Ten small boats fish out of the harbour, as they have done for centuries. Only a few hundred people live here, but the population swells during summer months. This is America's Cajwith. And it's where the first community-supported fishery began. Uh, hello, Kim. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you, Monty. Hi, Monty. Nice to meet you. How's it going? Okay. Nigel. I'm Nigel. How are you doing? Port Clyde fisherman Gary Libby and his wife Kim started selling directly to local customers four years ago. They immediately earned much more for their catch, from 30 cents for a pound of shrimp to almost $2. Contact with the fishermen themselves has been key to getting consumers on side. So they get to meet me, uh, one of the other fishermen, and they feel as though they know that person catching that fish. It's not like going to a big fish market and just buying a fish. Yeah. You're yeah. buying it from this guy that you know what he looks like, you know what his voice sounds like. They have a sense of ownership, like, like Gary was saying, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, know your fish, know your fishermen, and 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 they kind of own me. They do. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they, own, they own various own. bits of you. You're owned entirely by shareholders. <laughs> yeah. We will make the delivery happen for you today. All I need to the extra revenue and financial security enabled them to step up their operation. They now process their catch themselves, so earn even more return. While almost every other fishing community along the East Coast is losing its fish processing infrastructure, Port Clyde is expanding. Gary runs two small fishing boats, a trawler going for cod and other wet fish, and a lobster boat. Ever since he was a boy, Nigel has wanted to fish for lobsters in New England. Gary has invited him and Monty out for a trip. a lot of bait, Gary. Seems to be a lot more going in than we use in the UK. Yeah. The system is slightly different to back home. Gary uses square cages called traps with detachable bait bags. And he's catching a more docile species of lobster. But Nigel soon gets in the swing. I can settle in this pretty easy. This is uh, lovely scenery, nice weather, lobsters, yeah. pots are light. Sort of heaven, really. Yeah, you're heaven. a man in your element, aren't you? Heaven, heaven. Basically. I could shut my eyes and breathe and sniff the air. I could smell Lewis's bait, diesel, fishermen, fishing boats, and it really wasn't any different with a different accent. That's, that's all it was, really, to be quite honest. Give me two days there, and I would have fitted in and had a job and wouldn't have felt out of place. See Razor Bill out here though? Well, we'd be out here with us. It's be right. Yeah. She's right here. Yeah. Well, 
there's a lobster. Hey! Lobsters are part of the Port Clyde fresh catch scheme and are sold to lucky locals if no wet fish like cod are caught that week. That's a nice male. We're keeping that one. Since 1997, in response to falling stocks, the lobstermen in this area have self-regulated their fishery. They took control of quotas, reduced the number of pots per fisherman, and introduced escape panels for undersized lobsters. Also, if the pot is lost at sea, the hatch is designed to fall out after a few months, so there's no danger of it continuing to ghost fish. This bit here, this is the biodegradable bit, it's steel, so it just breaks off and that panel flips out. And the panel here, that's an undersized lobster, gets out. So simple, you know. Like in the UK, Gary marks and returns breeding females. And there is a minimum size of lobster you can legally land. That's a pound and a half lobster right there. That's easily big enough. There's a maximum size as well, ensuring that big old lobsters, potentially the best breeders, remain in the wild. The oversized thing is genius. So you return the oversized animals, because yeah. they're the breeding stock, and they meet other large animals, and they breed. And, yeah. and what's the state of your lobster populations at the moment? Well, we're, we're setting landing records every year now. I think this year's going to be another record breaker. We landed a lot of lobsters through the summer. The lobster fishery here is now one of the most tightly regulated in the world, but crucially, it is also one of the most profitable. Monty and Nigel have learnt how small boats can prosper by focusing on long-term sustainability instead of short-term profit. And they've seen how communities in the US are getting behind their local fishermen. Monty is inspired but what does Nigel think? Well, I think the word will get spread pretty quickly. OK, it'll start off gradually and then probably snowball slowly. And even if they only get, say, one small boat in Cadworth only gets 10 or a dozen customers and they're happy with the product they're buying and um, that's what they really want, well, that's, that's a good thing. I mean, it's also all down to if the people want the fish. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't sell it to them if they don't want it. Direct selling could help small boat skippers in the UK get more for their catch. But is there enough demand for seafood back at home? And are people in Britain willing to support their local fishermen? Next time, Monty and Nigel set some plans in motion. But there's some resistance to change in the cove. Getting a bunch of fishermen around here to work in a co-op is like getting a horse to live up a tree. Then winter storms blow in and put everything on hold. So there's genuine tension for me and genuine frustration. Yes, yeah, so you're very good out there, man. You're very good out there at all.